Thanks, comrades. Thanks for having me. This is actually my first delegates forum, so I'm very excited to be here and to present to you on this new legislation, which is your delegates' rights under the Fair Work Act. So what the closing loopholes legislation has done, the first wave of it, was input these new protections and entitlements. The first thing is what is a workplace delegate for the purposes of the Fair Work Act? Now, this is really important. Um, what it says is that it's a person appointed or elected in accordance with the rules of an employee organisation to be a delegate or representative, however described, for members of the organisation who work in a particular enterprise. Now, the reason why that is important is because if you are not elected or you're not appointed in accordance with the rules, which needs to be done once per year every September, if you haven't done that, then you won't be protected for the purpose of the legislation and you won't have the entitlements for the purpose of the legislation. So it's imperative to know that and ensure that you have undertaken the appropriate process. Under the new provisions in the Fair Work Act, a workplace delegate has the right to represent the industrial interests, including in any dispute of members in their enterprise, represent industrial interests of potential members. Now that's an important distinction that needs to be made because it's not just members that we currently have, it's obviously potential members as well. It's a potential recruitment uh, avenue for us as well. Now the next few dot points that I have on the slides are a bit more open to interpretation. Now reasonable communication with members and potential members in relation to their industrial interests and then for the purpose of representing those interests, reasonable access in the workplace and workplace facilities and reasonable access to paid time during normal working hours for the purpose of delegate related training unless the employer is a small business. Now that last provision is a carve out. Most of you probably won't be affected by that but it's important to know that if it is a small business, uh, then there will, that, that particular provision doesn't apply. So in terms of what does reasonable communication mean, reasonable will be an objective inquiry. It's not a subjective inquiry as to what the employer thinks or what the relevant employee or the union thinks. It needs to be assessed based on the facts of any given case. What might be an example of unreasonable in terms of communication with a, uh, with a workplace delegate would be not communicating with you in relation to, say, a show cause letter. Uh, not telling you that a member had been given a Shoko's letter. But for example, something that might be reasonable could be a verbally communicating in relation to that show cause letter, but not necessarily giving you a copy. So as long as you were aware of that, now like, arguments can be made either way, but you can see the point that I'm getting at, that if, that if you were aware of it and you're otherwise able to get a copy from the member, then that might be, um, might be fine for the purposes of the legislation. In terms of reasonable access, that could be, for example, not allowing attendance in meetings, not allowing the printing of materials, whether it's uh, the show cause letter itself, it's investigation materials, etc. There could be other questions that could be raised around um, just sticking with the theme of show cause is whether you're required to print those materials whilst you're on break or whether you are allowed to do that during your paid time. So these are things that haven't been tested yet that will have to go through, through the commission or through the courts. Now, in addition to those particular rights for delegates. Um, these are the general protections uh, under the Fair Work Act. Mm -hmm. The employer must not firstly unreasonably fail or refuse to deal with a workplace delegate. Secondly, knowingly or recklessly make a false or misleading representation to the workplace delegate. Or thirdly, unreasonably hinder, obstruct or prevent the exercise of the workplace delegate's rights under the Act or an applicable water enterprise agreement. So it's important to note that given that these are general protections, uh, it doesn't just apply in circumstances where you're representing a member. It could include that, obviously, but it applies across the board. These are broader powers and protections for you. In terms of an unreasonable failure or refuse to deal with a delegate, the meaning of deal is obviously very open, but it would be likely given a very broad interpretation as to what that means. An example could be not giving a response to your request for further information in relation to a show cause event. Um, and as I said before, again, these references to unreasonableness or knowingly or recklessly or unreasonably hindering, obstructing, etc., these are all objective inquiries that need to be made based on the facts of any given case. It's important to note as well that employers will still be able to undertake reasonable management action carried out in a lawful way. Uh, however, the onus of proof is on them uh, to demonstrate that the action is not unreasonable. So under the new changes, modern awards, enterprise agreements, workplace determinations must include a delegate's rights term, which I'll get into what that means shortly, from the 1st of July, 2024. And the Fair Work Commission will be required to vary awards to include a delegate's rights term. And we're currently in the process of doing that. Now, a delegate's rights term is essentially just a term that provides for the exercise of rights by workplace delegates. 
a delegate's rights term must provide at least for the exercise of the rights conferred by the Fair Work Act. So this is the reason why it's so important because the Fair Work Act is the starting point. It's not the basis upon which we should be negotiating clauses within our enterprise agreements. We should be aiming the bar way higher than that. If it falls within uh, a modern award, which we no normally incorporate into our agreements, uh, then, and the enterprise agreement doesn't provide as a beneficial term, then the modern award will apply by default. But Obviously, we're going to be trying to negotiate terms that are far more beneficial. So really the point of today is just to sort of get you start thinking about what those terms in an enterprise agreement are going to look like and how far we can actually uh, take it. So in terms of an employer complying with the delegate's rights term that's in an enterprise agreement or an award, um, they'll, take and, they'll be taken to have done so uh, if they've complied with the actual term itself. Um, and any reasonableness will be assessed by virtue of the size and nature of the employer, the resources of the employer, the facilities available in the enterprise. Largely what the reason for doing that is to uh, give small businesses an easier run, that is really the reason why, but it imposes more stringent obligations on, on bigger corporations. So if they have an IR or HR function, then what's reasonable for them will be slightly different to what is reasonable for a small business employer. Now, in terms of making the most of the, the new laws, these are already operative. So we need to be given serious consideration to what's going on uh, with these clauses going forward. And any uh, enterprise agreement from the 1st of July, 2024 onwards must include a term. So if you're in the process or you're about to be in the process of negotiating for a new enterprise agreement, this is something you should be giving serious consideration to. And so it's, it's critical for us as well as we're in this process because no test cases have been run on this yet that we run cases which support our preferred interpretation as to what this means as to reasonable communication, reasonable access, et cetera. Because failure to do so will mean that we get bad precedents. And if we get bad precedents, then it means that the legislation that we've worked hard to get in is basically futile. So in relation to say general protections, if, if the, the boss is acting against you in a particular way, there may be flagrant one-off breaches. There may be a, a big issue that uh, you take issue with, but often the way that these occur in the workplace is that they're small cumulative things that build up over time. And the best way for you to deal with these particular issues, if you feel like you're being targeted at work, is to note each of the times and write down and make a file note of each of the times that these occur. For example, if the employer un unreasonably uh, refuses to deal with you in relation to a show cause event, a safety issue, whatever the case may be, make a note on the particular day. That makes it easier for when it comes to the organiser. The organiser gives it to me or gives it to Julie in the branch and we then need to decide whether we're going to run a general protections case for you. Basically, the more uh, breaches that you can identify, the easier for us it is to mount a case. That can include a compensation amount for you individually as the person that's affected. It can also include huge penalties on the company as well. Now, the current maximum amount is 82,000 for a given breach. A given breach, for example, if the employer unreasonably fails to deal with you, that would be one breach. If there are a number of issues that arose out of that, they continue to do that in relation to one event, that would probably only be one breach. But if there are a number of things around hindering, obstructing, unreasonable failure to deal with, those would be cumulative breaches for which there's more pressure we can mount on the employer. So it's just something to think about in terms of when we're putting these things together, uh, to take the time to think about what are the issues that are happening on the site, uh, documenting those particular issues and get, making it as easy as possible to give it to the official that uh, uh, you're dealing with on site so that when it eventually gets to us and we eventually have a conversation with you about what's happening, we're in the best position to litigate it and prosecute it.